I've given this talk and it's the second time I've had technical difficulties. <laughs> we should have done, so got scheduled that break. Um, anyway, uh, my name's uh, Dale Henrichs and uh, I work for Gemstone and uh, I've been working on Seaside, porting Gemstone to Seaside just about getting, on, getting close to two years now. So, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, GLATS, the Share Everything Architecture for Seaside. So uh, first off, I want to just uh, talk about what GLASS is. I know myself, I use it a couple different times. So let's we'll see if this clears up some things. Uh, you know, the obvious one is, is GLASS stands for Gemstone Linux, Apache, Seaside, and Smalltalk. Um, and what GLASS does is provide persistence and scalability for Seaside applications. Um, it's free for commercial use, and there's the role for, for downloads. Um, GLASS is also um, a uh, gemstone instance that runs. It's a self-contained development environment for Gemstone S. Uh, uses Monticello for source code control and uses on the browser based uh, development tools. So, you know, there's nothing to stop anybody from going off and deciding to do the next big thing that's not a seaside, but um, and use and use glass. And of course Yanko and Aida, uh, they, they've been porting the, the glass as well. Um, and I think in, uh, for Scribo, it's Glass, and it's uh, Gemstone, Linux, Aida, Swazoo, and Scribo. <laughs> and finally, um, uh, I'll be talking about appliances, and what we have is uh, VMware. And well, that's what you saw booting, and that was what caused the delay, um, running an instance of Glass. And what happens when that, when that system boots up is Gemstone comes up, we fire off three VMs, all right, Seaside VMs to serve Seaside, a maintenance VM that does uh, garbage collection or um, actually uh, session cleanup for Seaside and garbage collection every so often. And then when we hook up a Scoot VM, we'll have a, a, another VM running over there. So that will be, and that's a gemstone VM. All right, so well, I guess it was back in February. Uh, Avi Bryant wrote a post and he did an excellent job describing the gemstone shared cache architecture. And I saw a comment on the blog, and somebody said, well, you, you can't do, you know, how do you do share nothing with Gemstone? And I'm thinking, you know, that kind of, that triggered, you know, the idea for this, for this, for this kind of uh, for the presentation. So um, basically the scaling story for share nothing is every time you need data, go hit the database, all right? Now, I, that's stretching things, obviously, because today people cache things, but, um, you know. When you're in a distributed computing and distributed data environment, you know, if you haven't cached it, you will be hitting a database or a data store somewhere else. And then that leads to, you know, well, it leads to complications in different areas. Um, and and uh, application programmers aren't necessarily able to take advantage of stateless things like Seaside in a shared open architecture. Um, like I said here, it's well suited for stateless web servers and an uncomplicated data model. Uh, the drawbacks for uh, a scale, uh, uh, share nothing architecture is scaling is limited by the available electricity. <laughs> you know, Google is like the, the poster child for this kind of thing. Um, and of course, but the, the distributed data model constrains how, how complex you can be. And for small talk, small talk is really not share nothing. Um, you know, for small talk, you have you share everything inside an image. All right. Um, everything's a message sent, all the objects are there. You used to being able to just, you know, find out anything about the entire system at any time, and it's just a message sent away. Um, unfortunately, once you go outside the image, you get into a more into the share nothing land. So you kind of ask the question, you know, maybe this, you know, can you have both the best? Can you have both worlds? And we think Gemstone is uh, is that possibility. So, because Gemstone was designed from the very beginning for very large images, um, shared between multiple VMs running on multiple machines. So, if you spread that VM out wide enough and broad enough, you are sharing everything across multiple servers and, you know, they have a fairly wide universe. I think technically, Gemstone is a share nothing architecture. <laughs> I think they say, if you have a central database, you might be qualified as a share nothing. So, Anyway, I think uh, so. I, you know, Gemstone is the perfect vehicle for doing share everything with the scalability of a share nothing architecture. Um, in the last couple of years, I guess in the very beginning, 
uh, the first time we came out with glass, and, and, and I'm not, I haven't been doing web programming all my life. I've been doing uh, server work and small talk. I've been doing small talk for a long time. So it's not like when we started Glass that we knew what it meant to have a scalable web application. So that's kind of part of what we've been going through during our beta period for, for Glass is actually learning about from everyone else what's going on and, uh, and along the way doing things wrong, which is fine. Um, so we started out with a single VM serving all sessions. And that lasted for maybe two months <laughs> before that idea was just shot down. Um, and then we went to uh, persistent session state. And where that is, we share, we persist all of the session state, share it through all the VMs, and expect any VM to serve any request from any session. All right, I'll, I'll get into a little more detail a little bit later. Um, along the way, we came up with this optional underbar S and underbar K. If you're familiar with the underbar S, is the session key. The underbar K is the continuation key. It has to do with seaside state and playing optimization games with seaside. And then the final one, which is like two weeks old, is uh, having one session per VM. So we go from all the sessions in one VM to <laughs> one session in, and, or one session per VM. So when we look at the persistent session state, again, we're storing um, the seaside session state in a repository. And so this is persistent. And the way Gemstone works, um, you got to make a little, little flavor of that on Tuesday, is when you modify a persistent object and do a commit, then all of the changes are saved to the database. And with Seaside, what we've done is in the free framework, we've, we basically, when a request comes in, we do an abort to get a fresh view, process the request, and then do a commit. Now, if nothing changes during that period, the commit is free. But if you've made modifications to persistent objects, then you get, you get a commit. So anyway, but we can take, uh, you know, Seaside, make it persistent, share it around, and we've been running, you know, it, it's pretty good for doing uh, fairly small, well, no, not fairly small, uh, 10 to 100 requests per second, you know, which is not bad. And so we've been, you know, we've been able to have, uh, you know, several hundred VMs serve, serve things like that. So the idea there is you deploy a number of VMs and use Apache to round robin requests to the VMs. And unlike uh, the standard Seaside, typically, because you have the session state in an image and you're not persisting the session state, you need to uh, do use session fitting. And so with Gemstone, we, we, we eliminated that with persistent session state. Uh, the drawback for this persistent session state is that you are requ your request rate doing a commit per request. And with Seaside, you're getting session state change, persistent session state ses session state change every request. So, so your request rate, rate limited, which um, depending on what kind of hardware, it could be 10 to 100 commits per second. All right, um, and so you can scale, and we have customers that do much higher commit rates than that. But you end up buying better hardware, better disks, and spending money in a different area, and. You know, frankly, that's this is but this is a model that's basically taken us through the first year with with glass. And you know, when you look at 100 uh, requests per second, all right, anybody not you know decide that they don't want to take that and, uh, on Gemstone, I mean, that's like 10 million requests a day, all right. So that's pretty good. That's pretty good results. But from Gemstone's perspective, what we were looking for was more. Well, that's not enough. You know, if there's a limit, if you hit the hard limit. You know, you get up to 100 requests per second, and now you continue to grow. What's your options? How are you going to go past that? So that was kind of what, what started happening, uh, you know, towards the beginning, you know, in the spring or so, was actually looking at the at least doing the, the thought experiment of taking this farther. You know, uh, the thought experiment of what if we were trying to do 100,000 requests per second? What would it take? And with the expectation and the hope that, like with the um, uh, space program, you got uh, Tang and Velcro, <laughs> that things would come out of this effort that we would learn and then be able to fold it back in. So, um, so the first, I, I would say I, I, I probably forgot to mention the first thing I tried, but it was, I, I decided it was a failure and didn't think it was even good enough to, to talk about. But basically the first thing we tried was to uh, share session state. So if you imagine you take a commit, don't change session state unless you really need to. And the imagination was in Seaside that the execution stack could be reused in certain circumstances. Well, it turns out that, that, you know, that didn't turn out to be a good idea. So then I went to plan B, 
which was you know, dealing with KNS because I thought, well, if, you, if, if we have persistent session state, and I, I continued with that model, but you don't save anything. You don't hook the session into a persistent loop. You don't save the continuation. That if, it, if it's create, well, you don't create a continuation for every page. Because again, in Seaside right now, whether or not you need them, you get new continuations created. And these are um, the uh, kind of WA render, WA re redirect kind of continuation that, that uh, Julian was talking about. But basically, don't save them if you don't if you if you don't need them to um, uh, basically render or render the page or or perform callbacks. Well, you're not performing callbacks, so but and, that, and that's basically what it evolved down to a RESTful interface in Seaside. If you did it today in 2.8 and you were doing it somewhat naively, you would end up still creating session state, as, as, and it would be aging at um, you know whatever whatever your ex expiry was. So. Um, that was the approach, was to say, all right, avoid the, the unnecessary session state. Then I took a look at, and what's the advantage, all right? And um, the numbers I've got up here, I sat down, oh, about two weeks ago, and got seven machines together. They totaled uh, about 72 CP CPUs. I fired up 128 VMs on these guys, and I was able to run at 7K requests per second, all right? So that's getting into the range of being able to do 100,000, all right? Now this is, you know, this is a, you know, a, actually I was creating 7K sessions per second because I was coming in, uh, or I would have if I was living in Seaside, um, or if I was saving sessions, but I was creating them and throwing them away without persisting them. Um, on, this, on this particular configuration, if I saved every single um, uh, request and, and did the, the uh, normal Seaside thing, I dropped down to about 200 requests per second, all right? And what's going on there is, uh, let's see, I have commodity disk drives and gemstone for performance can be disk limited. Um, we had uh, commodity network, all right, all in one gigabyte, but, <laughs> you know, I, we, were burning, we were burning the wires is what was going on there. And so at that point in time, it was like, you know, um, well, at least there's the option. And that was kind of where I went, went at that point in time as I thought, okay, if you wanted to go 100,000 requests per second, you would write an app to go 100,000 requests per second. But that's not really acceptable. And that's, that's what I'm saying here is you have to change the, your application. You couldn't do the things that you were doing, and, and that's not really acceptable. So interesting that you can go faster, but plan C. So um, I was uh, talking to Avi a little bit about his take on the underbar KS stuff. And, um, I think it was Ryan Simmons made a comment on my blog where I talked about this and said, well, can you, do, can you set up a, an example where um, you do more of the uh, session affinity, uh, like a normal seaside state, and then you wouldn't have to, or, or a normal seaside implementation, and you wouldn't have to sit down and persist uh, session state. There's technical reasons why you can't do things with more than one session, I won't get into that, but basically, the answer to that is if you were to do that, you would need to have one session per VM. And that's basically Avi's suggestion was, well, why don't we just have one session per VM? And I remember thinking back, you know, two years ago or whatever when I first got involved here and thinking, there's no way we're going to have one, <laughs> one VM per session. But when you think about it, it may not be such a bad idea, all right? And, you know, you would basically dedicate a VM to the session for its lifetime. So you would have VMs that are running that are sitting around doing nothing for 10 minutes if the session expiry is 10 minutes. And, you know, which is what session state's doing in, in your Squeak VMs right now. And in fact, I ran some benchmarks for Squeak that if you didn't save session state, um, the Squeak VM ran six times faster. So, you know, there's a cost here of saving that session state that if you need it, well, you pay the cost. And so this scaling story is if you need it, you pay the cost. And what, what's the cost is going to be uh, real memory. All right, and that's going to be a function of where um, in the real memory, you know, how much swap space can we take advantage of without taking uh, big performance hits. And that's basically where the drawbacks of this are. You know, like I said, this is a two-week-old idea. We've not really implemented anything here. But what um, James Foster and Martin uh, McClure and I have done in the last couple of weeks is worked through the issues that we could see that would keep us from being able to say, yes, we can do it. So maybe tomorrow we'll find the one that says we can't. But I think, I, you know, I like the idea better and better uh, going forward. And the kind of, you know, 
this has the possibility of going at rates that approach the um, um, uh, the uh, restful rates, all right? Because what you're talking about is what's the rendering speed that you can get, all right? And the rendering speed for that particular configuration was 7K requests per second. Ah, yes, Tony. Okay. Um, you know what? The gemstone is exactly like Hydra, all right? Um, in a sense, except that it, uh, you know, and I haven't looked at it any farther than that because there's other things, right? You know, we have persistent layer that, that, that comes in that I assume is not there with Hydra. Right, but Hydra will, will minimize the, the memory footprint by multiple sweep oh. images, right? Yeah, and we do, well, I mean, we've got similar things. I mean, you know, for the same reason that, you know, you talked about yesterday about not wanting to have a multi threaded uh, small talk VM, you know. Really having separate uh, memory spaces is the right thing to do. And when you get right down to it, when you're running multiple VMs, all right, we use MMAP, all right, we dynamically allocate and deallocate space as we use it. So we're going to be right in the range. Um, you know, and the bulk of the data is going to be your user data, and you can size those things. So I think you know the reality is is multiple processes on shared memory, you know, and one session per VM is going to work. And you know. Like I said, I think really it's going to be a sizing issue. You know, how many how many concurrent requests are aging in your system, and that's how many that's how many that's how much swap space you need. All right, and then the the curve of how many VMs are active all the time versus you know you want the peak performance and you know and there's other schemes. So you know the deal is is if we go down that path, there's things to figure out and, and not require you to have if you were going to have a thousand concurrent requests, you know, on Thursday for four minutes to allocate that much slot space all the time. There's, there's ways to get around that and still have all, you know, most of the performance because you're always paying prices when you, when you play these games. So anyway, I think you know, we're sitting down with Glass, all right, that you can take a Seaside application that you've written on Squeak, all right, and using the transparent persistence, which gives you the persistence layer, which I haven't talked about today, and I made the assumption that most of you understand that Gemstone has transparent persistence. You know, there's no, you know, no changes to uh, to your Squeak application in order to um, become persistent. Because in Gemstone, things that would be saved if you saved your image are saved when you do a commit. So if you hook things into persistent root and the garbage collector won't kill it in Squeak, it won't be killed. It'll be persistent in Gemstone. So, uh, so with trans transparent persistence, you can get your application to run. And then for, for, for scalability. And you can take either route, and it's really a switch. You can have uh, persistent session states, and, you know, and if, you, if, that, if that has the advantages, or one session per VM. And both of these combos will work well without changing application, your application at all. So you sit down and say, all right, fine. You know, you've got 150 VMs running on seven different machines. Um, you know, how are you going to debug that? How are you going to you know, deal with problems that, that come up while that's going on? And you know, so what we've done also in the last year is basically get support for when you're developing in Gemstone and you have multiple VMs running, how do you live in that environment and not go crazy and end up writing print everywhere in order to figure out what's going on? And so what, we, what we've got is uh, several features. Um, uh, the auto commit feature basically you have several VMs. I got four VMs in my appliance. When I'm doing development, and I every move that I make, I commit. So that means that you save in a method that gets distributed out to all the other uh, all the other VMs immediately. So it will simulate. The idea is simulate in the multi VM environment the experience of developing in a single VM. Um, there's an object log. Uh, this is, this was an idea it's that basically with multiple VMs, it's impossible to go off and look at 158 logs on files and figure out what's, what the heck is going on. And you never want to do that in, in a small talk application, all right? And, and many people use transcript show. Well, how does that work in a multi-VM? So the object log becomes transcript show, all right? Um, and an object log, ordered collection of objects in one spot, you know, and it's persistent, okay? Now we have to use an RCQ to avoid commit conflicts, but, you know, and, that's your, and we stick, you know, all kinds of stuff in there for just useful information, and it's all, you know, one spot to go look for. Uh, for debugging, um, 
you know, cell faults are obvious, but we've got breakpoints in Gemstone, and we've made it possible to set a breakpoint in your development image. The location of that breakpoint gets distributed out to all 150 VMs. Any one of those VMs happens to hit that breakpoint, it stops, and I'll, I'll give the demo here shortly, stops, allows you to debug that in your development image, and then continue. Well, in 150 VM thing, you're probably not the one that ran into the problem, and you'll be overriding error handlers to make this all work, but um, if you're debugging it in your own self, then in, your own, in your own universe, then you'll be able to proceed and continue, and I'll show that. And then finally, profiling in a, in a multi-VM situation. How do you do profiling um, and, um, you know, and, and manage the results? And again, what we do is when you click on the toggle profiling down at the bottom in the tool toolbar, whatever VM gets that request, he goes, okay, I'm going into profiling mode. Now I'm going to, what I'll do in the, in the, in the uh, uh, demo is I'll fire uh, Siege at the system, let it run for you know, a minute or 30 seconds or something, kill it. Then when I say toggle profiling and get it back, I'll be looking at the profiling for that, that particular VM. So you have the opportunity to, to collect results for a period of time. And, uh, so, okay. You might have to change glasses. My glasses. <laughs> but it doesn't take a reason to do that. So. Or, or, or changing the X server. So let's see. Oh, I had those and I forgot them. Okay. Um, so we're going to start with the object log. So what I just hit was the. Uh, is, is that, is that, can people see that? Yeah, yeah that's okay. good. Thanks. Nice. The, the files. So this is this is the object log. Um, one of the things that we throw into the object log is when we start up, um, we list. Uh, here's the list here of the VMs and their the, the PID that they start on. And um, just the structure of the object log, there's an object obvious, an object log entry, but the object log entry has priority, um, and you can do sorting on these fields. Um, it has a label, a PID, the timestamp, an URL if there is one. It's got an object, which is, this is a print string when we do the display, but if I come over to the priority and click on it, I, I come up in the Seaside debugger, and I start looking at, um, this is actually the object log entry, here's its class. Um, I, I show the loop, all gemstone objects have an oop. The whole idea here is, and this, you know, when you're doing uh, print statement debugging, because that's what we're doing here with, uh, with Seaside, um, how do you know these two are equal equal? All right, well, if the oop isn't saying they're equal equal. Um, and I typically, the last four numbers work for it, because <laughs> I can't memorize the, the, the six digit oops. Um, but if I click on the object, all right, what I passed in here was a string. All right, and uh, just, to, just to do that. But this gives you an idea of what the object log looks like. So uh, the next thing I want to do is um, come up and uh, go to the counter app. And so this is our standard counter app. And uh, this, is, this is my squeak image that is, oh, will be connected um, to uh, gemstone here. So I guess. This funny, the funny uh, uh, buttons is my fault. All right, so um, oh, this is this is part of the setup that I that I lost. All right, so um, I just wanted to show that yes, there's there's a couple things going on, but one is you get the hello world. Careful not to press the button there. Um, so you get hello world here from this. And you expect that, except that this is actually, hello world was actually executed. Uh, the transcript show was executed in a VM in the in the uh, uh, in the appliance. Um, and then there's also if we go back to uh, back here and go to the object log, we'll see that we got hello world there. All right. Um, you know, big deal. The the next thing is. To, to put something in here that's you know more interesting, and this is this is how you one one way for doing debugging would be to put a transcript show of an array of things. Now I got an oop down in the transcript, and uh, that's another reason why we're still beta. But uh, now I've got an array. In my you can see this down here, so I will go and inspect the object, and sure enough, you know, surprise, surprise, the, there's the object. So you know, and and of course you can come up with an inspector on the object log in your development image and be able to you know, do the normal small talk thing. 
with that. Um, let's see what we're going to do with those patterns. So the next thing would be to go in and modify, uh, put a breakpoint into the counter. Yeah. 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 So this is a squeak image running on this box, connected to the appliance, which is running VMware inside this box. And the the Gemstone VM that's serving the squeak image is actually running inside the appliance, and it's doing uh, communicate. Uh, we've got a wire protocol. For, uh, it can be it can be across the web. So what I'm going to do is set a breakpoint right here after um, uh, after that anchor. Come back into the seaside, go over to my counter, click on the counter. And so this is a case, I couldn't get the fonts bigger here, I, I tried. Um, let's see, what we have is, um, you know, this is another, you know, over in there handler. But basically you've got the stack, which is normal, and then you've got this, um, that says remote debug and proceed. And the uh, remote debug is new. And if you click on the remote debug button or uh, link, um, we've now created a continuation that we're now preparing to debug on the server side or on the, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the squeak image. And so I'll take uh, one step, I'll take a detour of the object log and show that what we have here in the object log is a resumable continuation, all right? So that means that if I debug and continue from the debugger, that continuation will be continued and the web request will be finished. Um, there's also all the other information like what VM actually caught the, uh, the breakpoint, the URL, and there's our, our, our print string for the stuff. So I'll go back to the development image here. So there is a debug button. There. So if I click on that guy. Yeah, so here's a debugger on the stack. And if I scroll down to WA counter render content on, sure enough, it stopped at this anchor point. Now I can come in here, and this is an inspector for the debugger. And I can look at the context. I can figure out what might be going wrong. Um, you know, Track the decoration chain down. But what I'm going to do is just go ahead and modify the code and say, um, hello, Isa. And do a save. And so now, the, with the auto commit, this guy got committed into the database and it's running now. So anybody else that might be hitting this website right now is going to see hello, Isa again in their, in their uh, debugger or in their, in their browser. And I'm going to proceed. And go back to the debug or the browser. <laughs> and from the browser, there is this little this guy here says resume. Alright? So what happened is if you if I had clicked on this resume button before I continued the continuation, it would say you haven't continued the continuation yet, and then we come back around. Alright? Now I'm ready to resume, and what we should see is the web page finish. Alright? Now, I get two fives, alright? <laughs> Go look at the uh, you know the code, and I stopped at anchor. We already had rendered the uh, HTML heading on, and then we went back in, stopped at the anchor, changed the code. Oh, the browser doesn't have that because the browser doesn't update. Another reason that the, the you know for the the betaness of the of the system. So if I refresh that, there's our there's our new code. So I changed this, saved the method that we started at the beginning, and did another heading. So. So basically, that's that's how um, uh, you know that, that enables you now uh, to, to to debug in you know, in a multi VM environment and not lose a lot of small talk. Um, see, if I go back to the uh, object log and just go in and see that that guy's a continuation now. He's still there, all right. In fact, I could, yeah, but he doesn't say he's resumable anymore. He's just a plain continuation. And if uh, there's lots of things. <laughs> what I'll do is I'll go in and inspect this guy because that's um, so I'm looking at, at the uh, continuation now, okay? And it's an, a subclass of um, it's a WA uh, object log entry, so it's got the, the object log state plus the magic that makes this work. 
I have the continuation, and so what happens when you hit the break point is the error handler snaps off the continuation, throws it into the object block. When I do the debug in the squeak image, I reify the continuation and bring an arrange for a debugger in the response to value for the continuation to come up. When I do a resume, I persist the process and stick it back in this guy, and here's the resumption process. Um, and then, in, when you get a resume in the client, um, it just says, uh, I forget the, uh, what you, well, I forget what you say about the process, it's the opposite of terminate. You just tell the process to run and it continues. Yeah, possible, yeah, it could be resume. Um, it's Gemstone, so that, I mean, you know, this is one of the things, Gemstone does have a few different um, messages, and so, uh, anyway, let's see if there was anything else that I thought I was thinking about. Oh, yes, yeah, profiling, yeah, okay. Um, so what I want to do here is, I don't need to do that for you. Um, all right, so if I go to, I'm going to go to the store and do it from the store, all right, the store app. And what I'm going to do is come down and hit the toggle profiling, toggle profiler, that's down here at the bottom here. And you'll notice now it says it's profiling, and that's the PID of the, of the VM that got, got the profiling. Um, I'm going to drop out to the OS, do a bang siege, all right? Let that run for a little while. Hit Control C. All right, we got 28 transactions per second on that hitting, hitting the store. Um, let's go back to here. Now, if I toggle profiling again, what should happen is we're going to bring up um, the profiler, all right? All right, I get an internal error, all right? There's a bug here somewhere, but. Here's what here's what you do. All right, here you know this is this is part of uh, I got an object log. Let's go take a look at the object log. All right, and you start seeing I've got some internal fast CGI errors here. All right, and we'll go down we'll go down to the first one right after the continuation and go inspect it and take a look at. We've got an array here, so what's in the array? Um, the first thing it says is interpreter error. The object semaphore may not be committed. Well, that's that's guaranteed. That's a commit error. Gemstone will not go ahead. Semaphores can't be persisted. Okay. So there's a there's some tiny error in my uh, profiler that caused you know somebody to pick up a reference, a process to pick up a reference. So what happened though? All right, if you take a look at the object log and count these, and I won't make this count. Up, there's 11 of them. All right, and the logic inside. I mentioned before that there's an abort and a commit. Well, the logic is you do an abort, you do a commit. Gemstone can have errors during commits or transaction errors, con conflicts. Um, when that happens, we just retry the request, all right? It's the moral equivalent of someone coming in and missing a timing. You know, when you retry the HTTP request, it's as if I went, I was about to click on the button and conflict with somebody, and then I waited a second and clicked, I came in second, all right? So we, so we do a retry, but we only retry 10 times. And the 11th time, we generate a, you, you've done it too many times there. And that's an internal error that by default just comes up and sticks something up in the, in the browser. In production, you want to catch that. In, uh, if you were to get an internal error in GemSource, which is running Gemstone, you get an error that says the uh, system administrator has notified every problem, go, go try again or something. And uh, in that case, I drop things into, the, into a log entry, or a, a, an actual, I was going to say paper log. I don't know why I think that way, but a file-based log. File -based log. Um, I guess you can get paper to look at them in the old days. That shows how old I am. Um, so, so anyway, uh, I think I shouldn't have taken myself down that path. Um, uh, transcript. Oh, yes, I think that's about, that's pretty close to what I was going to do. Can you bring up some, some kind of a picture of the profiler? Some, some oh, yes, that's right. I need to finish the profiling example. Because the, the answer is, if you go in and retry, all right, it'll actually, it should work unless something kind out here. So I'll just use the back button and then try again. Yeah, yeah, so this, this, <laughs> thank you. I almost left off the most important part about profiling. Not the bug. Um, so anyway, what this is, if you're familiar with the way that, um, I think it's, uh, oh, I can't remember now, it's uh, gprop. When it prints out the information about gprop, and that the C program it runs, what it does is it gives you the method that was called and how much time was spent in the method. And then it gives you the list of functions that called that function and how much time was spent in each one of those functions. 
It also gives the, the functions that it calls and how much it's done there. And then, of course, you can imagine that you, you have to navigate through that. So what this is is a list of, uh, I guess, the leaf, the leaves, all right, and ordered by, by tally, all right. This is how many times he was sampled while the thing was running. This is the percent of samples. This is, this will, uh, this will be, I'll, I'll show this one next. Um, you can sort on class, but this is the, the guy that we're looking at, all right. So let's go find an interesting one here. Um, I think RC key value dictionary oops. RC key value dictionary was the one that um, I think I found before it was interesting. So what you have here is um, the callers of RC key value dictionary are WA registry and uh, handle key request and key or nail for handler. And uh, the seaside geeks know exactly what's going on here. And in fact, to explain it, um, an RC key value dictionary is a reduced kind of dictionary. And Martin talked about that the other day. And um, the handlers, the, the, ses the session state for Seaside is stored in dictionaries. In Gemstone, they're stored in these, um, these uh, RC key value dictionaries. And so this is just a reflection of the fact that when you get a handle key request, you're doing a lookup. And when you do a key or nil for handler, you're storing something into it. Um, and then you can see the caller. And of course, you can now navigate using Seaside to go in and say, well, what's handle key, key request? Well, that's called by handle request. And we'll build up a picture now as we go through this of just what that call stack was and with the ability to go through multiple branches as you wanted through here because there are multiple paths usually into a different method. And, you know, some of the things while I was using this was um, I wanted to be able to, whenever I'm in one of these methods, I like to see the source code. So I know, you know, what, what things aren't being called, for example, and, you know, things like that. So, um, um, and this is based, I think, I, uh, Philip, I mean, uh, Chuzzy, Ch uh, Philip um, asked me if I could port this to, to Squeak, and it might be possible, but at the time this is based on the way Gemstone has, um, you know, builds up its graph. So, but it, it should be possible because I think this is a good, a good way to look at Pokemon. So uh, I think that takes me there. And if people have questions, go ahead and interrupt. Because um, I'm starting to you know, jet lag. Um, here we go. And we're down, to, we're down to near the end anyway. Uh, okay. okay. So that's, that gives you the demo. I think we're, you know, you know, at least for me, I've been spending the last year and a half actually living in this, this environment, and all this stuff that you see there is things that I ran into and in which there was a better solution for in dealing with this multi-beam environment. And again, you know, want to make that, that, that experience of taking your application, developing it in Squeak, getting it running, being happy, sitting down and going, okay, I might be, you know, I need to deploy this out, and I might be hit, getting some, um, you know, you have choices now, all right? I have persistence, how am I going to do that? Yes? Uh, the first five studies, but the speed Yes. Um, the, there's, a, there's a license, and the license limits the size of the database to four gigabytes, and limits the CP, uh, CPU to a single CPU. Uh, so that's the current license. Yeah. And beyond that, uh, there is a, there, we do have a, uh, the next step up is like $7,000, but I, I believe we're working on a new matrix for, and yeah, like, <coughs> pardon? Per yeah, but yeah, subscription, yeah. And, you know, for, you know, yeah. we're, we're, yeah. we're uh, we've offered suggestions for how to make that work, and they also, they also, you know, we, we started out with this package idea, we got the free, but, but for 7000 bucks, you went from one CPU to, you went from uh, 4 gigs a day to 16, you go from, you know, some place to limits like that. And, and they don't get the idea where people really maybe need to look, these things are really orthogonal. What if I don't have a huge number of hits per second, but I decide that instead of storing all my MP3s on the file system to get around this 4 gigs a day, I want to stick with, I want the 64 gigs a day instead of 4 gigs a day. But I don't need two CPUs, and I don't need more available than that. So, you uh, that. I think you uh, find a lot of personal requests. Other people, I think you can focus on that. Yes, you can just do that. You can 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 do that. You can
Well, that's, and, and, you know, we need to get we need to get that model, take that model, and see. I mean, um, the, the the I guess the, the, the um, response was we should take that to a web calculator, all right, and allow people to basically choose from column A, B, C, and also what do I need and how much would it cost? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's why we do have uh, on the website. I think uh, if you go to seaside.gemstone.com, and uh, actually. Uh, I gave. I think I gave the link. I mean, I, mean, I, I deleted the. I deleted this so often. But if you go up there, there is a. There is a play a way. If you go to my blog, and it says web uh, web edition. That's a link that goes straight to that page. Okay, and, and gives the pricing. And that's when we will announce uh, pricing changes. If, if you know, yeah, I have to say if I'm not management, but I can't make a promise. But yeah. but I think there's you know the fact that we have a free version of Gemstone out there. All right. That getting past that hurdle, the next step is really, and I think I'm glad. I'm glad we waited because, you know, a, a, a next step up or a set of options for, um, you know, when you have well, one VM handling all the sessions, and having one session per VM, the universe kind of changes on how you how how people need to grow. And you know, we I think getting to the point where we're starting to understand what the right combo for scaling Gemstone is. So the next step is then, you know, getting some feedback about what, you know, what kind of dimensions. But there's only a couple of dimensions, so. Yeah, we, we removed a couple of limits because we said they just don't make sense. And, and the, the good news and the point we'd really like people to be able to do is just run along, you know, don't pay us any money to start with. Start with the free version. And then we have ways with, through some of the statistics gathering we have to tell you whether you might need more CPU versus more shared memory versus more file space. You know, so the, the thing with the packaging was you went from zero to 7,000 and we're going to take what more 14,000 D. And he goes, no, what we'd like is people to, to run in three months. You go, ah, I need more disk space. What do I need? And you go and buy an increment so that you don't have to pay you know, before you get to that increment. We, we think that model will work, but we have to figure out what the, what the, what the increments are that it makes sense. It makes sense that uh, this space is cheaper to save than CPUs. You know, it's, uh... So that so we'll be you know we're 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 actively looking at that and, and actively aware that we can do that better. And you know, another reason for keeping it in beta, you know, is, you know until we solidify some of these things. We have two other models looking at two. We've been able to run this both on slice host and on Amazon EC2 fairly straightforward. So we can do a fade AI on Amazon for you pay your 40 cents an hour for a medium image and you go pay for 60 cents an hour or 80 cents, you know, pick some number there, you could just do that. And then and we're always open to pay as you go, but if you're a commercial company and you're making money off of it, we'd be glad to take a percentage of that and you can run whatever you want. So what's your question, Mark? Um, so, so what the potential is the 4 gigabyte sounds a lot, but I have just no idea or feel of what that actually means. The one processor, one processor today, you know, like I said, I think you can get up to 100 requests per second using CPU, all right, and, and a single processor, okay? It's really plenty. That's, that, I think that's plenty and, and spreading it out, you know, so I mean, you know, the numbers for that are, you know, I don't know, I've said it's a vanity CPU as opposed to what you really need. But, but it, it gets down to how much work you're doing in addition to this, all right? So that's, you know, I'm doing lightweight, you know, you know uh, tests. But, you know, there's a lot of space on a CPU. So the repository size is, the expectation is that's where, you know, the most, most of the things go on. And as you change repository size, there's a shared page cap size that goes along with it. So yes? Uh, you mentioned spreading out data between different VMs. Um, how does it work? Does it work uh, through a persistence layer into the database? And doesn't this cause a lot of stress if you uh, have uh, a lot of VMs then uh, need to get the data out of the database? So uh, that, uh, what you're saying is if I put persistent state into the, the database, doesn't that cause a lot of um, heat on the wires, so to speak? And the answer is yes, all right? And that's why, you know, I have been looking at non, you know, not saving persistent state. But the, but the truth is that you can do 10 commits per second on this box, writing to disk, all right? So, you know, and, and, and you know, so, so, but by not writing to disk, 
that's the better solution. And that's why I think, you know, like I say, that's that's why sitting back in February, we didn't just go, okay, now we're done. You know, you know, and because we're looking for the, like I said, I, you know, looking for the 100,000 requests per second leads us to better solutions for people that aren't going that fast. So, but you, you, uh, one of the solutions is to use one session per VM, but this uh, introduces a new problem when you get into persistence and spreading the data between the VMs. Ah, you, you, you can potentially have the same problem with now your domain data, okay? So the same kind of limits that I was talking about for session state apply for domain data, but, you know, and then that's just, that, that is a function of, oh, yeah, Jake? Well, and then the, the thing is, at that point, that's what Gemstone is providing the shared page cache. So you have in memory, uh, shared amongst the VMs in shared memory, the information that you want to share. And so, no, distributing persistent objects among multiple VMs is not any overhead. It's it's in a shared. Well, uh, you know, yeah. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a complex system, but we've been doing this for 20 years and have been worried about exactly that, all right? And, you know, there's there's like, there's 100,000 dials for Gemstone that allow you to tune things that are going on, all right? And the real beauty of for Seaside and Glass, as far as, you know, being from Gemstone, is Seaside is an application as far as we're concerned, all right? I know what that guy's doing. You know, you're, you're, you're fielding HTTP requests, all right? I can sit down with Siege and simulate exactly the kinds of things you, 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 you are seeing and in the lab figure out what kinds of problems we might run into, all right? As opposed to taking Gemstone and doing a Greenfield application and using it, you have to figure out what the tuning is. You have to figure out how that is. So I'm telling you that for somewhere on the order of, you know, 100 requests per second up to 500 requests per second, not saving session state, you know, it's not, that's, that, these are relatively small things for Gemstone and they're relatively easy to fix, all right, and take care of, all right. You know, it's, it's, it's getting up higher, okay? absolutely, if you have 150 gigabytes of data, you have, you have a load on your hands and you will be spending, you will be buying our training, you will be, you know, having people become total experts on this. But I think the beauty of the appliance is, you can get this thing running and use it, and use it effectively without ever having to sit down and, and do anything other than read a, read a blog and find out what's going on. You know, and that's you know. But again, because we have the you know, um, you know, we have a, a known application, we can set things up so that they work correctly. So, any other questions? I've got. I, my last slide was on Gemstone three, which is the future. You know, you know, we, we're, we're 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 coming out. You probably heard of Maglev. Bonnie will talk about Maglev. Um, later today, but basically Maglev and Gemstone 3 are essentially the same product. Um, Gemstone 3 will be the terminology for the small talk uh, part of it. Um, Non-trend-logged objects, this is for the Gemstone nerds out there. Um, and it would have been for, if I was doing persistent session state, you would have wanted this. <laughs> That's why we have that feature, by the way. Again, you know, Seaside, we're using it, we're banking on it. I sat down and said, we can save um, a lot of data here going to the trend log, because who cares whether you can recover session state if the, if the stone crashes. So we added that. Other people are going to benefit. These are the you know, paying customers. Um, the uh, native code generation, so it will be faster, or fa a faster uh, execution code VM. Improved the exception handling if you're familiar with Gemstone. Uh, James added exception handling a couple of years ago, ANSI exception handling. It will be native in the, in the VM with 3 m And then adding a foreign function interface. Again, for the Gemstone nerds out there, they go user action mode. I don't want to do that. Yeah. You saw, you saw a demo of that. Talk okay, you were running with 3L. Okay. Was interface. I didn't a line of C code okay. So and you were running in 3L for that. Well, for that. <laughs> and so you know, so 3L was something that's planned for release next year. There's a there's a bigger bigger list of features that go into the end of the thing. Um, and then beyond, you know, the next step when you're looking at the share of nothing, people start sharding databases. All right. You know, right now Gemstone be limited to talking to a single stone. Uh, you know, we've got ideas for that. It's not at the top of our list, obviously. <laughs> you know, but you know, it's something that that will probably happen in the next year or so. All right. Um, you know, things go well. So anyway, um, oh, I've got the, I'll get the ubiquitous pearls up there. And if we've got more questions, otherwise, you know, come and grab me. I'm walking around with James. Um,
when he gets the glasses, uh, the handwriting. And then we're going to have a tutorial just after lunch will start. And this is hands-on where you're actually going to be using your computer to connect to a gemstone database. And so uh, if you'd like to install gemstone on your machine, uh, maybe you should come early for that. Otherwise, um, I you have 64 bit hard. Yeah, you need 60. There's various qualifications. I have some DVDs. Uh, not enough to give everyone two or three of them, but enough so that we can share and get things installed if you want to get started on it. But you don't need to be running the 64 bit OS. You do not need to run the 64 bit OS to connect to my server. You also do not need to do it if you're going to run VMware. Right. If, you're, if your hardware is 64 bit and can do hardware virtualization, then you can be, I, I've run 32-bit Windows on 64-bit hardware and I can run 64-bit Linux inside it. So. Do you have uh, VMware images ready-made? Yes, VMware images ready-made. So if you've got VMware on your machine and can run 64-bit clients, um, we can get started on installing things. And that will give you a head start. Yeah. If you don't have VMware, you can download the free trial. Even the server, it's usually free. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Free, free, for, free for Windows and Linux, and uh, for the Macintosh Fusion has a 30-day trial. <coughs> free. So, turn up the wireless. Okay. Just the last announcement. Two short announcements. Uh, one, two, one is about the, the results of the awards. They are online now. So you have four results. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, Thank you.